Уважаемые коллеги, разрешите начать круглый стол. Правые проблемы использования воздушного пространства. Ну, прежде всего, представлюсь, меня зовут Оксаментов Олег, я один из модераторов круглого стола. Uh, let me um, introduce to you the participants in our roundtable. I would like to express uh, uh, our thanks on behalf of our narrow circle of um, air lore lovers to the organizers of the St. Petersburg uh, International Legal Forum because uh, back at the second forum before uh, we were listed as representatives uh, of uh, legal schools. I had to explain why um, uh, the uh, uh, phrase e law has the right to exist to the organizers. But I did manage to do that. And we are now holding a roundtable entitled Legal Issues of Airspace Use in Russia and Worldwide. And let me explain right away um, what we are going to mean by the use of airspace. Um, uh, this term has been defined in, Rus in the Russian uh, legislation as well as uh, in many foreign uh, nations' uh, doctrines, at least in the uh, um, uh, West European uh, legal family. It's uh, activity associated with the uh, relocation in the in airspace of various um, items, uh, like uh, aircraft. Uh, of course, aircraft is meant uh, specifically here. Uh, on the other hand, the use of airspace is um, interpreted as an activity which uh, uh, presupposes the possibility of, pos of um, uh, harm uh, caused to users of those aircraft as, uh, for their movement. And so when we talk about the movement of uh, um, aircraft in uh, airspace, uh, we call that relationship aviation. Or uh, in academic terms, uh, the relationships uh, regulating the use of airspace could be termed air law, and the relations arising from the uh, execution of, of uh, flights by uh, aircraft, we can term that as aviation law. This is the distinction drawn in the American and the US and European um, systems. Uh, the next thing I would like to call your attention to, well, uh, I would uh, introduce the speakers and um, uh, uh, moderate my co-moderator Sergei Aristov, uh, uh, Secretary of State and uh, Vice Minister of Transport of the Russian Federation. The speak the list of speakers include Yuri Maleev, uh, um, a Doctor of Advanced uh, Studies of at, uh, law, um, uh, the Department of International Law of Moscow State International Relations University. On my right is uh, Karl Marsovsky, Executive Director uh, for Legal Issues of the Czech Air Holding Company, including uh, CSA, the Prague Airport, and a few other entities. A practicing lawyer and uh, partner uh, of uh, the law firm um, um, Koshian uh, Solch uh, Ballastic, Yuri uh, 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 Hornik, and then Sergei Yuryev, president of the National Air Law Association, um, a doctor of law and practicing lawyer. In order for us uh, to structure our um, uh, roundtable better, 
May I say a couple of words? Uh, Michael Milton is uh, missing from the list of uh, from the panel. He's a well-known uh, lawyer in uh, uh, private air law and air law in general, and now uh, uh, honorary uh, president of McGill University in Canada. Uh, uh, from 1990 uh, 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 until 1991, uh, he uh, held various positions at the civil, International Civil Aviation Organization. And uh, his final position was uh, IKO's uh, chief um, lawyer. Uh, he has uh, kindly consented to sending his uh, presentation to us while uh, being absent, and uh, it's uh, entitled uh, um, the uh, um, uh, Civil Aviation Convention as um, uh, food for thought uh, uh, and rethinking, but the idea of re revising the Chicago Convention, which is turning 70 uh, um, years old today, will be one of the central issues today. And as a s for start, uh, I would like to call on uh, uh, one of the most, uh, one of the best known experts on international public uh, law, Yuri Maleev. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, w uh, what do I have to do with uh, air law? For 22 years, I was uh, head of the air law department of the State Research Institute for Civil Aviation. It was uh, almost an aeroflot structure. I uh, used to write books and monographs. Uh, uh, I uh, was uh, given uh, a degree in 1980, then a doctoral degree um, of advanced studies in uh, 1991. And I uh, uh, even uh, founded an institute of my own when the USSR disintegrated. It was called the Independent Institute of Air Law. I appointed myself president there, but it didn't last for long because back uh, when the Soviet Union um, uh, existed, uh, there used to be uh, big financial contributions uh, to the Civil Aviation Center uh, from the former um, uh, Soviet republics, and then for after three years, I uh, quit and uh, worked at the Lumumba University. Then I was invited by Yuri Kosov to the Department of International Law, um, uh, who asked me why I had uh, betrayed my own mother. Well, I, I said I didn't do that, but he said, who's your alma mater? I said, well, the uh, Institute of International Relations, so then come back, he said. And of course, I had to uh, uh, study uh, international law um, uh, to look competent uh, to my students. And uh, as soon as I had studied um, uh, a subject, I would uh, publish an article. So I published uh, a lot of articles on different uh, subjects. So when we had um, our uh, first round table today, it was dedicated to the principles of international law. And I could say a lot of things, but I kept silent. But one of the issues of uh, discussion, one of the subjects for discussion um, was um, a special note. Of course, uh, you could um, uh, try and uh, describe the new variety of international air law, uh, which is replacing the Chicago air law uh, system. Um, one uh, should realize that the international air law is going through a period of transformation. At the San Francisco conference, the United Nations Charter was adopted back in 1945. And uh, one has to follow closely uh, 
uh, what is going on there because in isolation, air uh, law cannot develop and it cannot develop develop in isolation from international law. And of course, international air law is a derivative of general international law. And what is taking place there are certain revolutionary things. In the first place, the United Nations organization has lost its influence uh, in uh, uh, deciding uh, in decision-making on issues of international air security. And the regional organization, NATO, in the first place, uh, assumed that role. Um, uh, so that has to do with international air law. And, to, uh, and there are regional uh, systems of air law taking shape uh, uh, in the first place. Uh, there's one in Europe. Uh, so the United Nations is losing its influence or rather delegating its powers to um, uh, the regional level, and the same is happening in international air law. Apart from it, certain principles which directly have to do with a aviation, uh, not only civil aviation, and the standards of uh, international air law are also of direct relevance to international law. For example, the principle of non-use of force. There's no such principle and has never been. Uh, there's the principle of abstention from or if restrained uh, from the use of force or refraining from the use of uh, force. Uh, and this is what is written in the UN Charter. I have re read the uh, San Francisco Conference uh, uh, records. Uh, there was an active debate going on about the term, whether to say refrain or to, or to stop the use of force. Uh, and refrain was the term they uh, settled on. There's the a well-known professor, Znichenko, in Russian uh, law. And when I wrote an article on the absence of the principle of non-use of force in international law, he said that Professor Malayev doesn't understand anything in uh, the English language. Uh, he said that non-use of force and refraining from the use of force is the same thing. But uh, um, at uh, one of the Scientific Council's sessions, I told him that uh, you will be, you will be ashamed um, of your words. And it so happened that right after that session, um, a party was uh, uh, held, uh, and the secretary of the Scientific Council uh, offered uh, a drink to him. And um, I uh, asked him, do you see the difference uh, between refraining from drinking and uh, non-drinking. Um, and uh, now, when um, the principles of international law are going through uh, revision, it is very important to see how this affects uh, international air law. Uh, the more so because many uh, do believe that uh, non-use of uh, force has taken shape in international air law. Yes. After the amendment of uh, three a point uh, to the Chicago and uh, convention, and uh, it uh, has that uh, particular standard of non-use of force uh, for civilian aircraft. Okay, the Chicago convention was amended, and uh, let us uh, recall the 11th of September, when the aircraft uh, some hit the. World Trade Center, 3,000 victims. The U.S. president issued a decree. I don't remember the exact name for it, and it made it mandatory for the military to destroy civilian aircraft, uh, no matter who the passengers are, children or women, if uh, there is a, 
reliable information that uh, the civilian aircraft uh, uh, target uh, the facilities uh, which uh, pose a threat, a threat to the state security, like uh, nuclear facilities or gas facilities. If the explosion is there, thousands of people might die. So just like uh, similarly what uh, happened uh, in the WTC uh, and uh, well the collateral damages I don't know what kind of decision you would take but uh, I am sure you would have taken the same decision waiting uh, standing by for thousands uh, of uh, victims waiting till the faci nuclear facility explodes or gas depository gas storage facility with the thousands of uh, victims so uh, you see what uh, adjustment life makes the life makes so right now in the uh, common international law there's a revision of uh, such things or take the non-interference into the internal affairs and uh, there is interference uh, uh, the aircraft uh, are used uh, and, uh, to maintain law and order. The U.S. are doing that. So what should be the attitude towards that kind of aircraft? Should they be allowed to pass uh, or grounded or shut down? Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, air assets are used because uh, it's a uh, fast response uh, carriage of uh, soldiers. Uh, and, of course, it, uh, all these things are related to the airspace regimes. And I would like to take the liberty to state that uh, the principle of uh, non-interference in the infernal internal affairs does not exist. We got used to this uh, particular word non-interference and uh, we uh, miss uh, the uh, word uh, in the e e e sense and uh, all the other things are internal uh, things and uh, you take uh, paragraph 7 on article 2 if uh, it is uh, the uh, Somebody will have to evaluate the subject matters. Who will have to do that? Uh, either the Security Council or some other entity. And uh, in this uh, case, uh, if uh, something is uh, wrong, we cannot possibly send troops. And uh, we will have to wait uh, till uh, when the judgment is made by the Security Council. So this uh, particular principle of uh, non-interference uh, and it affects uh, the use of airspace and uh, the use uh, of uh, aircraft. And the uh, Chicago Convention uh, divides uh, uh, the aircraft into civil and state. State, uh, military, police, etc. But uh, it is uh, the principle of registration is applied. There is a register of uh, civil aircraft and state uh, aircraft. But you know what is happening in the world. The uh, state aircraft are used uh, to rescue population when flooding occurs, uh, other natural disasters. So civilian functions uh, are performed and uh, military aircraft do not intend to shoot somebody uh, down, uh, take uh, what is happening in the Urals and uh, there's flooding over there and uh, thousands uh, of uh, people are affected and uh, so the emacom of our aircraft uh, are used over there and military aircraft as well they take uh, soldiers uh, over there that uh, are involved in the search and rescue operation these are peaceful uh, uh, activity and so they cannot be uh, treated as a state even if the uh, sovereignty of uh, another na nation is uh, violated they should not be shut down they should be assisted and on the contrary uh, there's a great number of uh, the aircraft uh, that are registered as uh, civil they are used uh, to haul soldiers weapons sometimes they can even drop bombs if they own privately then how should we uh, treat these uh, aircraft should we just abstain from shooting them down no we should uh, shoot them down because they take uh, actions to make one party to the conflict uh, 
stronger, they participate in the conflict. conflict. So that's uh, another development that is happening at the uh, territory of many countries in the Ukraine as well. So these are the changes uh, that we face and uh, I have referred to as functional aircraft. Not uh, quite a, a convenient word, but uh, in, there is a way out for the not in general, but for the purposes of the Convention, the third term should be used, not only civil or state aircraft, but functional aircraft that are used on a temporal basis uh, for military purposes, and so they should not be treated either as uh, civil or military. Take another uh, factor, it is uh, opposing terrorism uh, and the aircraft uh, are quite uh, contributing a lot and the, the bombs uh, are planted into the aircraft and uh, the aircraft are used uh, to obstruct the satellite uh, navigation system. There are hackers like that and uh, there is a law in Russia. It is uh, the law on uh, employment of mili military forces beyond uh, the limits uh, of uh, the uh, country. That is virtually at the foreign state uh, territory in uh, the places of concentration of the terrorists. This uh, could be uh, regarded as an aggression or invasion. How come without uh, the clearance uh, from a foreign state, uh, the military invade with, uh, uh, of course, by means of the air assets? And is it legal? Is it, uh, a con uh, is it uh, allowed? But what is the, the other option? Should we wait uh, till the terrorists invade uh, us and the, the other have biological and chemical weapons? Uh, should we just stay put? No, we take care of the lives of our near and dear, so preemptive actions uh, should be taken. Uh, even at the uh, foreign state territory. And uh, the aircraft uh, used then, it is related to the airspace uh, regime. There is a derogation uh, like exemption from the commitments uh, under exceptional circumstances. Uh, well, uh, but uh, over here we have a specific role of the air aircraft and uh, Mr. Bakhtiyar Mohamedov and uh, at the previous uh, workshop he is uh, he has uh, coil, coined the word preemptive uh, self defense when it is uh, clear that uh, they are going to attack you to assault you there are terrorists uh, the other side uh, of the river then you should attack them first should you re use boats then uh, you will be destroyed. So aircraft uh, might be used for that uh, kind of exceptional cases. And in this uh, case, uh, we should not talk about uh, the violation of the airspace. And uh, so that's what is uh, related to combating terrorism. And uh, we have a concept, a decree of preventing or not uh, clearing uh, drunk passengers aboard. We have uh, frequent cases like that and, well, that situation is uh, clear cut. So there are many facts uh, which indicate that the common international law and, uh, is undergoing transformation and adaptations to meet the requirements of the international situation. And uh, so the specialists of uh, different uh, domains, not only lawyers, uh, should uh, conduct uh, conferences uh, to include uh, politicians, uh, economists, uh, lawyers and the military as well uh, to prepare a new convention on air law to take into consideration different uh, employment of uh, aircraft including CO2 emission into the air because uh, global warming is uh, related to a lot of uh, oil and gas and uh, coal burned 
and thus uh, heating up uh, the air uh, atmosphere. And uh, there are many states uh, that are not uh, uh, signatories to the convention. And the, we have uh, the uh, cap uh, sales, uh, the African nations, they don't have any facilities uh, with uh, chimneys and with stacks and over there, but uh, they are signatories uh, to the uh, Kyoto uh, protocols. And uh, there are other member states that have a lot of facilities. And uh, so the Africans are selling their quotas uh, that are allocated to them for good money. And uh, airspace is affected and uh, so that kind of aspect like uh, environment uh, it uh, should be covered uh, by the aerospace uh, regimes we should uh, give a thought uh, to such uh, aspects uh, as uh, follows what this air law convention uh, include uh, the uh, incumbent uh, 44 convention should be improved or a new one should be in place and the air law is fragmented there is no un unified single uh, document uh, like say the marine law of 1984 uh, or so we should uh, bring it all together have a single instrument or we might amend uh, the existing documents so these are two different approaches uh, and I am in favor of the International Air Law Conference. I was not the one to suggest it. And uh, there was a thesis in uh, the International Relations University in Moscow uh, dedicated to, to the International uh, Law uh, Convention. And uh, the girl uh, who defended the thesis uh, was not the one who invented it. Uh, there's a discourse uh, abroad. So different standards uh, should be codified within the framework uh, of uh, some air law convention or as i said uh, have a fragment different fragments amending thing existing instruments what i refer to is uh, public uh, law but we have uh, a vast uh, uh, international uh, law it is uh, international uh, private law the warsaw system which uh, was initiated in the 20s. Uh, it's uh, with respect to the responsibility of the carrier. Then there were uh, protocols like uh, the Hague uh, Protocol, and it ended uh, in 1999 with uh, the adoption of Montreal Convention, with, uh, which uh, brought together all the documents. And a certain Mr. Ostroumov has defended the uh, doctorate uh, thesis, and uh, you can get hold of it uh, in the internet. And, uh, and uh, if uh, not, uh, I can uh, send uh, my email uh, to you and uh, my uh, wife will push the button and they will receive uh, the, his particular thesis. Anyway, there's uh, a codification. And uh, since uh, 1999, the codification in the international private law has uh, stopped. And uh, there's still, uh, there are still deliberation in uh, the uh, public uh, law. And uh, the uh, doc uh, the documents and uh, the materials that Dr. Milbert had uh, sent, he is uh, talking at length uh, about uh, the different world uh, of uh, nowadays and uh, 1944. The world of 1944 is different to the 21st century world, and uh, so all uh, the existing realities uh, should be taken into account, and the standards should be adopted. And the convention is uh, still the Civil Aviation Convention, and that's why it uh, should be changed, and it should be a law convention. Of course, uh, it will uh, take a lot of time. The Marine Law Convention was being developed for 10 years, and so we don't know how Air Law Convention will be developed. Another important aspect, there are 19 supplements, uh, addendum to the Chicago Convention, and uh, different rules uh, were harmonized regarding the flights and formalities, environment protection, air traffic control, 
management and uh, and uh, the names are different, like standards and recommended practices, and they might uh, have a different leg degree of uh, legality and. Uh, but uh, all the states uh, should uh, respond to that. Uh, but uh, many uh, developing countries don't uh, have uh, the technical uh, capacity or they don't have experts uh, to respond uh, to this uh, memorandum, to this uh, letter. They either have uh, immigrated uh, to, say, Paris, and uh, or they are not experts in uh, this uh, area. And uh, the developed uh, countries, uh, the US, uh, France, uh, the UK, uh, might be helping these uh, nations if airports uh, would be built uh, over there. and. Uh, but uh, at the same uh, time, it is unlikely that uh, the U.S. and the U.K., the other nations, would be building the uh, airports uh, for the sake of developing the economy. The money would be in invested to uh, provide support uh, to the uh, flights of their own aircraft into these emerging countries. But anyway, this particular process uh, is... Uh, objective at the market economy people businessmen are undertaking to generate uh, profits no problem with that and uh, but the problem is that uh, the developing countries will be getting only poorer because uh, the smart people they migrating they do not get back uh, to their uh, nations let me make another joke we had a discussion drinking coffee and uh, the postgraduate student uh, of uh, the international relations university he is from one of the muslim countries and i asked him ahmed uh, will there be a third world war and uh, he, he asked uh, be between what uh, parties, uh, I said, of course, uh, between the Muslim world and the rest of the countries, jihad. And uh, he looked around and he said, only fools uh, are involved in uh, fighting. We should uh, move around and uh, settle down and uh, breed and uh, work. And uh, if uh, the legislature allows that, uh, we should settle down and get citizenship of, of those uh, developed nations. So smart uh, people is uh, actually related to the brain drain, and uh, the brain is gone, and uh, the poor nations cannot develop aviations, and uh, what the developed nations are doing, it is... Uh, to their own uh, merits and their benefits. They don't uh, set the target, the goal of uh, developing the economies of uh, these uh, nations. So this uh, affects uh, directly on uh, what approaches we should uh, take. If we agree uh, to the adapting the convention new air law co convention without revising the Chicago Convention of 1944. That's what, uh, what I meant to say. Thanks uh, for listening. And uh, the internal biological clock uh, was uh, ticking, and uh, so he fit into one academic hour of 45 minutes, but we continue, and uh, it doesn't mean that uh, Yuri will, won't be given floor anymore. He will be, and I would like to request Mr. Aristov, uh, Deputy Minister of, uh, Minister of Transport, State Secretary. Good afternoon, esteemed uh, colleagues. I would like to uh, thank uh, Oleg, uh, for arranging the uh, transportation uh, unit over here. If uh, some of you have uh, been the participants of the previous uh, forums, you might have taken note of what were the names of the round tables. These uh, were general uh, abstract notions, but uh, lawyers uh, should be dealing with specific uh, matters uh, as well. Transportation 
uh, accounts for 6% of the GNP of uh, this country. That's so why the legal aspects of uh, the functioning of this sector of the economy are important. I wanted to speak elsewhere first, but the first speaker raised some issues that I cannot but respond to being a, an active government official. It's difficult to argue against a professor, but you have to, because I'm referring to his phrase that uh, an emphasis is made on national legislation that tries to substitute for international law. I categorically, I flatly oppose to this for just one simple reason. We have two types of transportation, aviation and law and marine law, entirely built on international law. ICAO and PIM, and so we have a reverse problem to address, dear colleagues. In aviation, it's been decades now that we, ha we live half, one half according to the law, like the regulations of ICAO. We follow them 100% just a couple of years ago. The ins next ICAO's inspection showed Russia was much ahead of many European countries when it comes to compliance with standards or recommendations from ICAO. While the national legislation in Russia lags behind those international laws, we do use international law without having incorporated them in the Russian national law. Even the Russian national air code, if you read it carefully, is not in line with the incumbent requirements. The national legislation lags behind rather than prevails over international law. So this is where I disagree with what was said. It's been like five years or so that the whole uh, bulk of what the Minister of Transportation has been doing in legal drafting, legal initiatives in aviation, is focused exactly on applying and amending the Russian national regulations to provide compliance with international law. Just look at this week's um, schedule of the national parliament in Russia, State Duma, where a bill is going to be enacted on making amendments to the air code of the Russian Federation uh, re regarding the requirements to airfields. And it is going to be done by applying international standards to Russian aviation. Well, as a follow-up on this, I want to say also that this topic today, the roundtable discussion, the use of the airspace in Russia uh, is very relevant indeed. Well, I have some uh, figures from my colleagues that you need to really ponder about. 25 million square kilometers, this is the area of Russia, the average density of air traffic in this country, while Russia is a transit country through which a lot of traffic should go, is only 53 to 55 aircraft per thousand kilometers, square kilometers. Is it a lot? Let's take UK. The air traffic density is 160 times higher. In Germany, 140 times higher. France, 90 times higher. Yes, we're very large as a country, but that is because we service about 1.5 million aircraft per year, but we only use our airspace 300 days per year. Remember, it's 365 days in a year. And it should go, actually, 24 by 7, why, which is wh uh, why? Because organization of air traffic is not efficient enough. We do not live to what we can do. Up to a quarter of the Russian space, is n of the Russian territory, is not covered with the air rescue service. Like you remember that aircraft situation in Malaysia, it was lost, the plane was lost in the ocean. The same thing can happen in Russia without no ocean around. 
just because we lack radar services to do this. And the transportation development, the national transportation development policy until 2030 has a large section on air traffic uh, with a lot of emphasis on subsidization of air traffic because of social significance. We have one half, half, one half of the Russian population east of the Urals have never been to Moscow or St. Petersburg. Why? Because the, traffic, uh, the uh, ticket fare is such, the airfare is such that, well, you have to work for a few months to be able to afford an, air t an airfare. That may have come from price liberalization. It is up to the carrier now to establish the price, not the government. And the carrier has become a monopoly, unfortunately, and the carrier dictates the prices. Of course, they include the fuel price, the fuel costs. This is a, an oil-producing country, but the price of kerosene here is six hi times higher than in Europe, who have to buy kerosene. An amazing thing, isn't it? So, I think there's a lot of things to be done uh, in regulation and legislation. I'm not in favor of the government regulating at all, but I'm not also not in favor of the free market which is not well established yet in terms of understanding of the social needs of many, many people here, and it is not mature today. This is why we try to find a good balance so that without interfering too much with the business, uh, we would like to make the aviation business to serve the best interests of the people, not only for their own sake. We have lots of areas in this country, in the Russian Federation, with uh, no-fly zones. This is a long, uh, age-long war between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Transportation in the Russian Federation. Vast spaces where we cannot use civil aviation. If you know a little bit of geodetics would know, that you cannot possibly have plants in excess of 500 per square, which is an amazing thing. Uh, a satellite, a satellite photograph will show you a, a box of matches, but the civil aviation maps fall years behind that. For aviation, that means additional costs, because you need to fly over an area, which uh, increases your costs and the amount of kerosene consumed, and it means impossibility of using those territories for selling, let's say, selling traffic there. From the figures I've got, I can share these ones. We have... 12 million Russian citizens, just think of it, 12 million Russian citizens who live in 300, in, sorry, 30,000 places of residence who have no access to around the year transportation. Hence, there must be air traffic services. This is why it is just necessary, it is a must to develop aviation. To conclude, distinguished colleagues, I would say that this is, I'm, I'm not just marking the problems. All the plans we are drafting and developing aim at addressing these essential problems so that they could be overcome in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei Alexeyevich. A couple of words, if I may. Yes, Yuri Nikolaevich, just a few words. Maybe my hearing is uh, impaired now, but I didn't mention a word about the Russian Federation in my presentation, did I? I was talking about the emerging economies in Africa, Latin America, 
and others who countries that are not able to do certain things. And the second thing was perhaps a misunderstanding, but apart from the second rule, all absolutely all recommendations are really recommendations, whatever the title, which means that the government is free to cancel any standard in 60 days' times. I've visited Montreal like 20 times, and I know that perfectly well. And another thing to mention, it is really important that we need to uh, establish the height limit of the national sovereignty. Everybody operates with 110, 120 kilometers above the sea level, uh, where the natural satellite uh, can fly, but it is not established in any international document. But this figure is in use. Why don't we try to enact, to legalize a figure? Because actually you can end up with satellites being uh, fired at with missiles. The French sometimes suggested the height limit, the Eiffel Tower, there was a joke of this kind, yeah, a long time ago. Then people started to think maybe making it a little bit higher than that. Then the General Assembly was considering, started to consider that thing. Any decision of the General Assembly is a recommendation as well. It's a soft law, so to say. And during the discussion, there was a talk that why don't we make it at 60 kilometers, the height limit of the sovereignty, then no one space no airspace, no spa uh, outer space, and then the outer space. What for? I don't know what should be then. If a missile is, is launched from Baikonur or Plesetsk in Russia, but the ground does not stop from turning, it's vertical, it uh, launches vertically, and Russia is large, but sometimes in the Near East or in Europe, the, your rocket, your missile, appears to be above somebody else's national sovereign territory. So, should it be fired at? There were some uh, calculations and estimations that that limit should be enough to uh, use a curved trajectory to leave anyone's sovereign space and then to get back without taking a risk of being fired at, but some figure must be arrived at. Of course, we are happy. Uh, Russia can enjoy it. What about Israel? And uh, a nearby Arab state, uh, there could be an easy conflict between the two just because of legal confusion. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri Nikolaevich. Now, well, the first presentation of a more practical nature. I'm giving the floor to Irji Hornik, partner for the Czech company Kochan Scholz Balastik, Prague. As far as I remember, Irji is board member for the European Association of Air Law. We met him first in Bucharest at a conference uh, on the air, air law and he's professionally been involved in this uh, range of issues. His uh, presentation will be on single European sky lessons to learn. And I think it will be very useful for ourselves because on the 29th of May, Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan signed the agreement on the Eurasian Economic Council as from January 1st, 2015, it is scheduled to be effective as an international uh, union. So we, this m may be very relevant for ourselves. European experience, Sergi, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, of course, I'm, uh, my presentation is going to be more practical, as was, uh, as was uh, just said. In any case, uh, I would like to thank uh, the previous speakers uh, because uh, some of the elements of their presentations uh, will help me to uh, provide you basically uh, with a background <coughs> how uh, the uh, provision of air navigation services work, uh, works in practice. Uh, 
Um, first of all, of course, uh, what I will be talking about is uh, more or less the use of airspace, uh, uh, which is definitely more peaceful uh, than it was discussed uh, during the uh, first uh, presentation. We, uh, I won't talk about uh, interfering uh, the territory of a foreign state or of any state. I would rather talk about uh, the situation where one of the aircraft is interfering the operation of another aircraft. Uh, and of course, to, to avoid that particular situation, <coughs> uh, you need to uh, have somebody uh, who, ah, now it works, uh, who would control the operation of aircraft in the air. And uh, that what we call is air traffic control, uh, or, or in general, uh, somebody provides air navigation services, which is a bit wider term uh, uh, used uh, in practice. Uh, the, the, uh, the air navigation services provision is quite common, and it's a mandatory to be provided in every state, as the Chicago Convention clearly says. Uh, of course, in some states uh, it is a bit easier, uh, as it was mentioned, that, for example, the uh, capacity of Russian airspace uh, is uh, definitely better than the capacity of airspace uh, in many countries in Europe, so you still have plenty of uh, free space where you can divert the traffic if there is something happening. This is not the case, unfortunately, in Europe, where the traffic is really dense, uh, or the density of the traffic is very high, and that's exactly the reason why the European legislator came with uh, a project uh, which is called the Single European Sky, and uh, the, the base or uh, the purpose of that project is uh, to provide more efficient uh, air traffic control uh, to provide more efficient air navigation services. Uh, I will try to, uh, because I'm not sure to what extent, uh, to what extent you are familiar, how does it work in practice, how the air traffic control is provided in practice. So I will uh, briefly introduce the way how it works, which will also allow you to understand where the legal issues, uh, legal issues as such might be. Uh, first of all, uh, what is the uh, objective of the Single European Sky Project as it was introduced uh, by the European Commission and the European uh, legislators? Uh, it has two, uh, in principle, two levels, and I, I'm, of course, explaining that in, in plain words and in very simplified way. But we can say that there are two main stakeholders, states, and the air navigation services providers who are uh, functionally, um, many times, especially in Europe, functionally separated from, uh, from the state, which does not necessarily have to be the case elsewhere in the world where, uh, for example, the, serv the air navigation services are provided directly by the states. Uh, on uh, the part of the states, uh, the main objective of the single European sky is to design the airspace in a way that uh, national or state boundaries are not relevant anymore. And I will explain in a couple of minutes why, it is, uh, why, why this objective, uh, objective was uh, more or less uh, set. On the side of the air navigation services providers, uh, the main objective is that they should cooperate more among each other uh, and uh, create more or less something which is more efficient because of course if you have a uh, single provider per uh, each state and that state is quite small in the European context, uh, it increases the costs because technically and operationally, we are now in these days capable of handling the air traffic uh, with, uh, within a single center, uh, more or less in the entire Europe, which is unfortunately not the case. Every European country has its own air navigation services provider or air traffic uh, provider uh, itself. So they, they should uh, cooperate more, and the European Commission even says that uh, they should eventually consolidate 
which of course uh, is like a red flag for many of the providers because no, nobody wants to uh, get consolidated. Everybody would like to stay in its uh, current uh, status quo in, and then operate as it was used to operate. So now coming to the pictures uh, uh, and basically explaining how it works uh, so that you understand where the, uh, the, the legal uh, issues are. Uh, of course, uh, and it was mentioned uh, by uh, both previous speakers, that one of the issues which we are facing uh, uh, when we are dealing with air law or aviation law is state, state sovereignty. And uh, it's, uh, it's a bit nightmare in practice because when, of course, you are negotiating anything and, uh, and then all of a sudden uh, the, the second party comes with an argument, but it's the issue of state sovereignty. And we, we cannot, for example, accept that particle uh, argument uh, you, are, uh, you are submitting. Uh, sometimes they are right, sometimes it's really misused. Uh, and uh, the, the especially in the area of, uh, of the provision of air navigation services, it's quite common it's, that it's misused. Uh, in practice, it works in a way how you can see on the, uh, or a sort of legal theory, theory uh, would be uh, that uh, if we uh, stick to the uh, state sovereignty uh, concept, uh, and the borders are not really straight, straight lines. Uh, perhaps in, of course, Russia might be a bit different because there, are, there is a huge territory. Sometimes you may really have straight line, uh, which is easy to cross, but it's not the case in Europe. The, the, the border lines are, uh, as uh, for example, shown on the slide. And if you stick to that state sovereignty concept, it might be quite operationally difficult uh, to uh, control the traffic uh, because at certain point uh, the aircraft may all of a sudden go through the territory one state then just jump into the territory of another state if, if, there will, if there is an aircraft coming from the north to the south on the borderline uh, so uh, he may in five minutes be crossing the borders a couple of times. So it's not really practical and in practice it's done in a, in a bit, bit different way, uh, although it is done on, uh, not on at, uh, at the state level, but rather at the level of uh, the providers. And the providers, they usually conclude an agreement, <coughs> which is called, uh, which is called uh, 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 LOAs, so, so, so to speak, uh, meaning uh, letters of agreements, letter, uh, letters of agreement and they agree on basically how to, uh, how to put the national borders straight. Uh, not of course from the legal point of view, but from the operational point of view. So it uh, may quite well happen in many European countries that uh, the handover of the traffic is done not really from the legal point of view at the borders, but uh, in a different way at the borders which are more or less agreed among uh, the uh, air navigation services providers uh, concerned. Uh, in, practice, in practice, it uh, looks like that. Uh, these borders are borders between uh, Germany and uh, the Czech Republic. And you can see uh, that although the uh, actual uh, national borders are definitely not a, str a str uh, straight line, uh, the uh, from for, for the operational reasons, they were more or less adopted to that, which is that uh, uh, red uh, red line. Uh, that means that one of the providers in this particular case, it's German provider, provides uh, the air traffic control above the territory of another state. So, in principle, to some extent, interfering its uh, national uh, na national sovereignty. Uh, this has never been uh, an issue, it was rather a practice. Uh, it was only one, uh, 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 there was one case, uh, so-called e Eberlingen case, which you may recall where there was a mid-air collision uh, between two aircraft above the, Swiss, uh, above the, in the airspace which was controlled 
by a Swiss provider, uh, but the territory where the uh, crash occurred was German territory. Uh, and that particle uh, provision of the services was uh, provided on the basis of a uh, letter of uh, agreement concluded between the providers, uh, between SkyGuide as a Swiss provider and uh, DFS as a German provider. So that was uh, one case where it was really uh, reviewed uh, by the court and the court at the particular time said that uh, the providers cannot uh, among themselves to agree on, uh, on providing the services in the territory of another state, uh, which was in principle known even before, but it was uh, sort of uh, from f uh, due to the operational reasons uh, neglect neglected. And uh, the uh, importance uh, of that particle issue uh, was not drawn to the attention of the legislator at all, because uh, the, uh, the providers more or less uh, were happy with that particle uh, setting. Uh, of course, uh, and, and we call it uh, that that particle arrangement of how the air navigation services are provided, small-scale cross-border operation, because it's really small-scale. You can see that it's, it does not really go beyond, uh, substantially beyond the national borders. Uh, and now coming back to the project on the single European sky, uh, which says that the states uh, are supposed to be responsible for designing the airspace uh, regardless of national uh, boundaries, uh, meaning that they should not really look where the national boundaries are, but they should more or less airspace, uh, create airspace uh, blocks uh, where uh, the uh, air navigation services will be provided uh, regardless as to whether it is uh, in, uh, in a one particle state by uh, the provider of that particle state or uh, they may be provided by the provider by other state. How uh, does it work in practice? And we are, we are coming to uh, from that small scale cross-border service provision uh, which is more or less practice everywhere and I assume that it will be even practice I mean, uh, in, uh, in, uh, here in Russia with some of neighboring countries. Uh, so uh, the European Commission says, but uh, we want to extend that, of course, with the blessing of the state, uh, states, not uh, really having uh, the uh, navigation services provider, providers doing that themselves. Uh, so with the blessings of states, th they would create sort of airspace block and it's called functional airspace block where, there, where it would be possible that one, uh, where the air navigation services provider from one country provides the services in another country and uh, it may be really extensive cross-border service provision. Uh, that, of course, brings uh, a lot of legal issues because uh, the states are a bit reluctant uh, to allow a provider from another country uh, to be responsible for the uh, air traffic control in their own uh, territory. And uh, that uh, basically is the, the main issue why the, the, the entire project uh, so far uh, is not too far. How, uh, what is basically the target situation? If you look at the slide, uh, there is currently nine so-called FAP initiatives uh, because of FAP, uh, the, uh, which are supposed to create uh, functional airspace blocks. And those blocks, uh, and in those blocks, uh, these services are supposed to be provided regardless of state boundaries, meaning that, for example, if you look at the very yellow portion, which is uh, the functional airspace block uh, created by Spain and Portugal, uh, so the uh, ultimate idea is that it does not really matter as to whether the services in that particular airspace block will be provided by Portuguese provider or by Spanish. It should be really driven by operational uh, needs and uh, it should not definitely follow the national boundaries. 
How it was done uh, from the regulatory point of view, uh, there were three, or basically there was, of course, initially one package called, so, uh, called uh, SES-1 package, which was adopted in 2004. But unfortunately, as I have already indicated, uh, the states were reluctant to implement it, uh, and uh, in principle until 2009, nothing uh, significant happened. Uh, due to that particular reason, the uh, Commission adopted uh, uh, another package uh, which was supposed to improve that situation. Uh, that package is called SAS2 package, which was adopted in 2009. And the states were obliged by that particle package to uh, create functional airspace blocks by the end of 2012. That happened. Uh, in that uh, respect, it, uh, the, uh, the aim of the package was, uh, uh, was fulfilled. However, I, sh I should also add that uh, it was rather, rather uh, formally fulfilled because the, now we do have functional airspace bo blocks created. Uh, but from the operational point of view, it does not really work as it was originally anticipated. Uh, the reason for that is that most of the states created uh, functional airspace blocks, but in any case, they still within those blocks divided uh, the uh, control of uh, air traffic uh, along with the uh, national borders. Uh, the Commission was not happy. Uh, again, and then uh, uh, what is now currently happening is that uh, there is so-called SES 2 plus package being negotiated, uh, and hopefully it will be uh, um, uh, it will be adopted uh, this year. Uh, we will see as to whether as to whether it will be more more powerful than the previous packages, because you can see that after almost 10 years. Uh, because the project originated in 2004. Uh, there are really no tangible benefits. Of course, there are some improvements, but the original expectations uh, have not been for sure met. Uh, what are uh, the main lessons to learn? Why uh, the SES project uh, failed, or it, it does not actually fail, uh, failed because it's still being implemented, but it is definitely not implemented in the uh, pace which was originally anticipated. Uh, first of all, uh, I have already uh, mentioned that is the lack of commitment. The states were originally not really happy with that a foreign provider would be providing services in their territory. They wanted to keep that uh, business for, for their own provider. And what they come uh, as, as an argument with is uh, that mentioned, uh, that I have, as, I, as I have already mentioned, as the sovereignty issue. They said we cannot uh, uh, leave somebody else to provide the services in our territory. Uh, because we need to control our airspace. That argument is false, I, uh, I believe, uh, because the air traffic control does not really control the airspace. Because, of course, the air traffic control provider guides, uh, provide, uh, uh, they provide guidance to, uh, to aircraft uh, not to crash uh, one into other. Uh, and the ultimate responsibility for the control of the airspace is in the hands of the states, the states anyway, because it is not the air traffic control or uh, air traffic controller who actually can enforce uh, the entry into the airspace. Uh, of course, the, the, from the operational point, point of view, yes, but if uh, that uh, guidance is not, not complied with, it is not the air traffic controller who can prevent the aircraft entering. It would be Air Force uh, who would have to eventually come and make uh, the aircraft land uh, or uh, prevent the aircraft from entering the territory. So it is still within the hands of the state, uh, I believe, and it's not, uh, this is not uh, an issue which would have something to do with the state sovereignty. Then the second important issue is uh, the decision-making process. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, that's uh, always the issue as to whether the states, when they are forming fu functional airspace blocks, which usually, some, sometimes they are composed of two states, which is fine, you can easily agree on everything, but many times the number of the states uh, is higher and it goes up to, up to seven, uh, seven, eight states. Uh, then of course, uh, you must decide how you will be uh, deciding on uh, the issues which are uh, popping up every day uh, or how you will structure the design of the airspace. And what then comes on the table is uh, what is going to be the decision uh, making process as to whether uh, consensus of all states or, uh, for example, a certain level of uh, majority or qualified majority. Uh, and that's, of course, the issue because the states, again, they come with, uh, with uh, the argument it's a matter of national sovereignty. We need to have a sort of consensus. Uh, but then in, if you look at some of the European states where you have really small states with no significant uh, air traffic, uh, so those small states would definitely try to prevent their own national provider and they would definitely be in favor of the consensus and they would eventually block any significant progress. So in that, uh, from that perspective, it's better to have a majority uh, principle but uh, you can imagine how difficult it is to, uh, to uh, adopt it and uh, to have a, such a decision-making process in practice because the states are really opposing to that. And that relates to the discussion on the revision of the Chicago Convention, uh, which was uh, already mentioned here. And uh, Michael Milde, uh, if, uh, which, which is a pity that he cannot be here, uh, he is arguing, of course, that the Chicago concept is also uh, really bad because it's more or less based on a uh, sort of concealed uh, consensus where uh, you cannot really adopt uh, decisions uh, on the basis of a majority. So, uh, and many of the FAP initiatives, uh, they are based uh, on the consensus, which is also the reason why they cannot uh, proceed more uh, efficiently towards the goals as they are uh, outlined in the uh, European legislation. Uh, then, of course, there, there is a couple of legal issues uh, which were not dealt with at all because the Commission, when they were drafting the legislation, they focused more on the operational and technical aspects, uh, how it should look from the airspace design point of view, how, uh, how the airspace would eventually be designed. But what I believe the Commission forgot uh, or been, uh, neglected uh, are certain uh, legal issues which are commonly used uh, again as, as a sort of excuse why that project cannot be implemented. Uh, the first issue uh, is linked with uh, different operational rules uh, throughout the Europe. Or then of, co of course, even from the operational, the, the operational rules are more or less harmonized due to the uh, need to comply with the ICAO annexes. Uh, but there are some differences, and those differences are difficult uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be settled uh, because uh, one state, for example, verti vertical separation between the aircraft might be different in one state, uh, and, in a, in a, and its neighbor uh, may have the vertical separation of aircraft uh, different by or minimum vertical separation different by 50 meters, and then uh, the issue is as to whether the provider who is providing the services in the territory of its neighbor is supposed to comply with uh, the vertical separation as it is uh, uh, for which the provider is in principle certified in its home country or as to whether the vertical separation uh, applies uh, based on the airspace where the services are provided, which is then quite difficult if uh, there is uh, to be a seamless airspace uh, dedicated uh, to the provision of uh, air navigation services. Then the issue, is of, uh, then the issue which uh, popped uh, up was uh, so-called joint designation because uh, when you want to have a single provider for the territory of more states, you must somehow designate that particular provider. 
and the concept of joint designation was uh, just uh, briefly mentioned in the legislation, but uh, in, nobody really knew how it should be done in practice as to whether the provider who is uh, for its national territory, the, the providers are usually designated uh, in compliance with the national rules. So how they, would, uh, how they would be designated for a territory of another state. Uh, and uh, the states were really unclear how it should be done in practice. Uh, so uh, that's another legal issue which really did not help to implement the project because uh, each state, uh, a state who does not want to implement will always argue that this particular issue is not clear and it will delay the implementation of the project. Uh, then the last two issues which I would like to mention uh, are the, the liability for cross-border service provision, uh, which is also not clear because we do have a uh, number of syst liability systems introduced throughout Europe and uh, in each state uh, there might be a different liability regime. It might be the state who is, uh, who is primarily liable regardless who is providing the services. Uh, in other states it is only the air navigation services provider who is liable. Uh, and it, it is of course difficult then when you are supposed to forget about borders to say who will eventually be liable if there is a, a provider providing the services in the territory of a foreign state. And the last one, which relates uh, to uh, the cooperation of air navigation services providers who are supposed to cooperate more. And one of the means of cooperation is of course, for example, common procurement. Uh, but the rules on common procurement are uh, to some extent harmonized uh, throughout the European Union. However, it is not clear to what extent, for example, uh, providers from uh, different countries can commonly procure. And it's again used as, a, as an excuse why the providers cannot uh, cooperate more because they say it's not clear uh, to what extent we can commonly uh, procure. So that's uh, in a nutshell uh, what are the issues related to uh, the uh, provision of air navigation services and the project which is currently implemented in uh, the European Union. And I believe that, or well, I hope, that you, will, uh, you won't face those issues. Uh, for example, due, uh, when, that, uh, uh, when the single uh, Euro-Asian uh, sky project uh, will be uh, implemented now with Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, was it Kazakhstan? Uh, so, when, when you start really implementing the project, I would advise you uh, to, to deal with those issues and because they, they will eventually uh, uh, come uh, once you start uh, really working on, uh, on a practical implementation of, this, uh, of, of your project. Thank you for your attention and I'm of course ready to answer your questions. Uh, thanks, Yuri. Any questions? Ready to take the questions uh, either from the floor or from the panelists? Okay, let me say a few words why the floor is uh, silence and uh, I believe uh, there's uh, still uh, a lack of understanding why the same rules of I care in the annexes I other standards or practices and uh, so uh, the might be of different uh, force and uh, look uh, at uh, the st uh, chairs that you're sitting the standard is uh, four legs if the legs are three you might fall on your neighbor so standard is something that you should uh, comply to for the aircraft uh, to fly without uh, dropping and uh, the practice is uh, to have an elbow rest it is uh, so the differences in the needs uh, in uh, the uh, technical force and uh, you both uh, could be declined thank you anything else it just uh, occurred uh, to me that uh, 
now we have a Russian uh, Czech round table because uh, we have uh, two representatives of uh, Czechia over here in the panel and uh, Michael Milder uh, was born in uh, Czechia, uh, Czechoslovakia though living in Canada and uh, London from time to time and uh, Dan I would like to give uh, floor to Mr. Karol Martsovsky, the Executive Director Legal Affairs of uh, Czech Air Aero Holding, and uh, the paper he is going to talk to is uh, uh, entitled Selected Practical Legal Issues Connected with the Operation of Flights Between the Russian Federation and the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so before maybe before I will start my uh, presentation, I would like to uh, address uh, three uh, very short remarks to the three speakers who, who, who spoke uh, before me. Uh, as regards uh, Professor Malayev, uh, you told that, uh, um, among others, that uh, there is the possibility of, uh, or there should be even the possibility of a preemptive strike against the civil aircraft if this is uh, for example carrying bombs or or terrorists who are endangering the security well uh, of course uh, everybody who is uh, thinking uh, in a rational way agrees with uh, with this uh, principle but uh, on the other hand i would like to stress out that uh, of course uh, in such cases there must be always uh, always um, a very deep investigation let's say which is not sure that you have enough time for that uh, whether uh, the the reason to to um, make such a preemptive strike is uh, is very well is is justified uh, and uh, in this uh, in this um, connection, I would like to remind to one uh, case from the history, which is uh, very controversial and disputable until uh, today, and which was the case of uh, the Korean Airlines uh, flight in 1982, if I recall it correctly, or 1981. Um, so the Soviet can, Union strike. Exactly, the Soviet Union strike against the Korean airline flight. So we can come back to this a little bit uh, later. Um, as regards uh, Mr. State Secretary Aristov, you told uh, that uh, there are still uh, places in Russia uh, or, or regions in Russia which uh, have very bad transport connectivity. So in, uh, or no connectivity almost to, to transport. So uh, in this regard, I uh, also I would advise you maybe to, to take inspiration uh, on one issue or one thing of the, of the, from the European Union, which is the so-called uh, public service uh, regulation for airlines. So if uh, you have regions which are very badly serviced by, uh, by any transport means, it is possible to, uh, let's say, appoint one of the airlines as a public service provider. What does it mean? It means that the airline is operating these flights <clears throat> at its own, but in case that uh, the economic result of these uh, flights is loss, loss, so the flights are loss-making to, uh, to that region, uh, then the state would, uh, let's say, give uh, sort of state support for the difference. So the difference between the, the uh, costs of the airline for operating, uh, for operating the flights and the actual uh, results of the operating of, of this flight. But only in case of losses. Of course, if the flights are profitable, the state does not give uh, anything. So on the other hand, I also have to warn that uh, this should not take uh, such an extent as it is uh, already now in Europe because there are certain uh, regional airlines, for example in France, which are living to 90% from uh, state support uh, because they are operating only uh, flights to these kind of, uh, of regions or, or islands. So this can be also misused. So it is very hard always to find uh, the balance between justification of a public service and uh, where should already commercial service, fully commercial service uh, start. And uh, to, as regards Mr. Uh, Mr. Hornick's uh, 
um, presentation, I also fully, fully agree with your uh, statements. Just one small remark, why there isn't maybe, or one of the reasons, uh, I believe at least, why there is not so much uh, interest from the side of the air traffic companies to, let's say, to uh, agree on, on, on certain uh, common provision of, of those services or, or, or bigger integration of, of the provision of such services is, of course, uh, that this is also kind of a business. So uh, uh, each of these uh, air traffic control providers in each European country is uh, a normal uh, company operating for, for profit. And uh, for example, in the Czech Republic, the air traffic control uh, company of the Czech Republic is uh, uh, financially very stable and very well functioning uh, company. So of course, if you can earn quite a lot of money with uh, such services, you are not so much willing to give over or hand over a part of your uh, profit to uh, an air traffic company from uh, a neighbor country, for example. But of course, that's uh, only one of, the, one of the reasons. So let me start my presentation. I will talk about uh, three very quick or very practical examples, which at the first sight may be have nothing to do with uh, aviation law. Uh, so, uh, but at the end of uh, my presentation, I would like to, to come to a conclusion which will uh, show you that uh, these issues very well might have something in common with, uh, with aviation law, or even they should have something in common with aviation law. All of these three examples which I will mention uh, are based on, uh, on actual uh, experiences from operation of flights between the European Union or let's say between the Czech Republic and uh, the Russian Federation. As you might know, Czech Airlines is operating uh, flights to eight different uh, cities in, uh, in, in the Russian Federation. So uh, we have quite a lot uh, practical experience from, uh, from uh, this part of, uh, or from this, this kind of business. So, uh, first of all, I would like to mention uh, the VAT, or I would like to talk about VAT exemption for ground handling services. What are the ground handling services? If somebody doesn't know, ground handling services are the services which, I provide, which are provided to the airline, uh, basically at the airport before uh, departure and, uh, and uh, after, after uh, landing. So for example, the check-ins, where you go and with your passport and receive your boarding pass and uh, the baggage handling and all the other works. This is called ground handling, basically. So uh, <clears throat> in the European Union, under the uh, currently valid regulation on uh, the common system of value-added tax, uh, there is a very clear, uh, or a quite clear, let's say, uh, exemption for VAT on these ground handling uh, services. There are only two conditions. Uh, first of all, uh, it, uh, the services must be provided to an airline, and such airline must operate chiefly for reward on international routes, which means that at least 50% of the routes operated by that particular airline shall be operated to international destinations. Uh, and this VAT exemption is also applicable for services provided on European airports or EU airports to airlines from countries outside of the European Union. So for example, if a Russian airline is flying to, I don't know, Paris, it also does not have to pay VAT on the uh, ground handling uh, services. On the other hand, uh, in Russia, you have a very, very similar uh, regulation. Um, the basic exemption uh, relates to the servi servicing of aircraft, which is uh, regulated by the, by the tax code of the, of the Russian Federation. And then there is a, a decree, uh, I think 241, but the, the number is not so important, a decree of the, of the uh, Russian Ministry of Transport, which explains a bit more in detail what is meant under uh, servicing of, uh, of aircraft. I don't want to go into very much detail because tax 
law is not my specialization and uh, and also I, I suppose that I assume that you are not so interested in, in, in tax law uh, details. The result is important. The result is that uh, the let's say, interpretation of this VAT exemption in the Russian Federation is very ambiguous. So uh, neither the tax authorities nor the courts have a single interpretation or a clear interpretation what is exempted from VAT and what is not exempted from VAT, which leads uh, in practice to the fact that on some airports the airlines are paying VAT, on some airports the airlines are not paying uh, VAT, which creates uh, e for the airline and also for, but also for the state, uh, a situation of uncertainty and uh, differences between uh, diverse regions within the, within the Russian Federation. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, another issue what is, uh, what is related to that, for example, that if you are operating as a foreign airline flights uh, to Russia, you have to have uh, a representative office uh, in, in the territory of the Russian Fed Federation, which is uh, perfectly, perfectly okay, but such representative office cannot be registered as VAT uh, payer. So uh, in case of payment of VAT to the state, uh, the representative office is not able to reclaim uh, or, or to get refund this VAT from the state as it would be, for example, in, in, in other countries. So the question at the end is, is this situation a breach of the principle of reciprocity established by the respective air services agreement. Because, of course, the air services agreement between the, the Czech Republic and the Russian Federation says that both countries are fully entitled to apply their tax uh, legislation. Uh, on the other side, it should be based on the principles of reciprocity. So it's, the airlines from one country are paying VAT in the other one, uh, then uh, the others, uh, the, then it should be vice versa. And, and if they are not paying, then it should be also vice versa. So this was the this was the uh, first uh, practical example. The second practical example is the designation of EU airlines under bilateral air services agreements between the respective EU countries and the uh, Russian uh, Federation. So uh, what is a so-called designation? If uh, you would like, as a foreign airline, if you would like to operate flights to the territory of the other country, uh, you need to apply for so-called traffic rights. It is not automatic that you can simply fly from one country to the other one. So uh, if you apply, and the uh, granting of such traffic rights is regulated in bilateral or sometimes multilateral, but in, in, in our case it's a bilateral uh, treaty, international treaty, called Air Services Agreement, um, where you have certain conditions for the granting of, uh, of uh, traffic rights. So under the, uh, this is called designation, so an airline is designated by one country to fly to the other one, and the other country designates also one of its own airlines to fly to the first country. So this is how it works, always on the pre on based on the principles of uh, reciprocity. So currently uh, the most air services agreements include uh, a certain uh, condition uh, which says that uh, the airline designated by one country has to be owned in majority or effectively controlled by citizens or entities of this respective designating uh, country. This is, let's say, the elder model or the older model of, uh, of air services agreements, but they, they are still, uh, still in place. Uh, now, uh, since uh, the Open Sky decision of the European Court of Justice from 2002, uh, under European law, uh, I mean EU law, it is quite clear that uh, this particular criteria about uh, the ownership and, uh, and effective control uh, is breaching EU law and the EU uh, is now very much pushing a so-called EU 
designation, which means that uh, there would be a clause in the air services agreement which would allow, for example, if we are talking about uh, flights uh, from the Czech Republic to Russia, so there could be not only airlines owned by Czech entities, but also airlines owned by French, German, British entities, which have their principal place of business in the Czech Republic, they could be also designated as, as uh, airlines for flights uh, between the Czech Republic and, uh, and, Russian, uh, and the Russian Federation. Um, however, so far uh, in the practice, I believe there is only one uh, such an agreement where this was really agreed, and I think this was between Finland and, uh, and the Russian Federation, but I'm not very sure about uh, this. Uh, in the in the other in the other uh, air services agreements with between Russia and the EU member states, you have still this old uh, requirement of, uh, or mostly you have still this own uh, this requirement of uh, of um, effective control or, or ownership by citizens or entities from this particular uh, country. What are the consequences that uh, the European Union is requesting so strongly to accept this, uh, this uh, European, so-called European uh, designation. The consequences uh, are basically that uh, sometimes the negotiations on, on air, new air services agreements or on the renewal of elder, elder uh, air services agreements are, are blocked. Uh, and uh, the only possibility how to solve or how it is solved in the practice uh, the, is that uh, in the new air services agreements there is no explicit mentioning of the criteria of ownership or, or effective uh, control or if it is uh, mentioned, it is not mentioned in the very clear way as the European Union would like to, to have it uh, in, the, in the air services agreements. Um, my personal opinion is uh, on this uh, particular issue that, uh, that uh, we have to we have to notice that the criteria of, uh, of uh, ownership or effective control uh, by citizens of, of, uh, of a respective country is not really working now in, in, a, globalized, uh, in a globalized world because all the, the companies are very much, uh, are very much uh, connected and uh, the, there are shell, foreign shareholders, let's say, in, 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 in a lot of uh, companies, uh, a lot of airlines. In Europe now the last uh, big acquisition was for example uh, the acquisition of shares in Air Berlin by, by Etihad Airways from uh, the United Arab Emirates or the same uh, is prepared in relation to Alitalia. Etihad would like to buy a portion in, in Alitalia. So in these cases uh, for example the requirement of, of ownership would not uh, would not work anymore. On the other hand, I, I am also quite critical towards the position of the of the European uh, Union because I'm not very sure that uh, this uh, European single designation, let's say, uh, is leading to to the uh, required uh, to the required uh, result. So that was the second issue. And the third and the last issue which I wanted to, to mention are uh, practical issues connected with certain rules on, on, on uh, protection of, uh, of passengers. I took only two uh, such practical issues. The one of them is the question of refundable uh, versus uh, non-refundable uh, flight tickets. So, under, uh, if I'm informed correctly, under the laws of the, of, of the Russian Federation, the sale of non-refundable flight tickets to consumers is not allowed. However, there is an exemption for uh, foreign airlines, for tickets sold by, uh, by foreign airlines. 
Uh, in the European Union, the, the sale of non-refundable flight tickets, on the other hand, is mostly allowed. It depends from uh, the conditions of carriage and from the fair conditions of the respective airline, which are governed always by, by local law. Well, uh, these differences uh, lead to the fact that, for example, EU airlines are often selling also uh, non-refundable tickets to, to Russian citizens. But uh, the Russian consumers are then confused because they are used from their own market that there is nothing like a non-refundable ticket and that they always need to, to get a refund. So it leads uh, to a lot of uh, absolutely unnecessary, uh, unnecessary litigations between foreign airlines and, uh, and consumers because uh, at the end, uh, at the, end uh, the, the courts recognize the, the exemption for the foreign airlines, but uh, the airlines have to invest quite a substantial amount of money into these uh, litigations. So, uh, <clears throat> and the courts sometimes interpret uh, these rules also differently, so this again creates uh, an environment where you have regional uh, differences. Uh, the second issue is also connected to, to passenger compensation, uh, the so-called uh, moral damage, or in English you call it rather non-pecuniary uh, damage. So uh, this is a question of uh, civil law, or purely a question of, uh, of civil law. Uh, in the practice, uh, the experience is that uh, in Russia the compensation of uh, moral damages claimed by, by uh, passengers is almost always automatically granted uh, by the courts. So it is enough for you to say uh, for example, there was a huge delay and for this reason my experience from the flight was uh, impaired negatively, so I want moral damage of one million ruble. Nobody knows uh, how did I count that amount, nobody knows uh, um, what is, let's say, the, the, val the real value of such uh, impairment uh, of, your flight, uh, of your flight experience. And the amount of compensation granted is uh, always full in the discretion of the, of the courts. Um, in the European Union, there, is, there are very different also uh, regulations on this, uh, on this issue. There is no unification uh, also on, on that. Uh, but uh, moral damages in principle in all countries are subject to the very same criteria as actual damages, which means that the claimants need really to prove that uh, some damage occurred and uh, that the occurrence of such damage is really attributable to the, to the, ab to the other party. Uh, the third criteria which is, uh, which is given is that uh, the amount of the granted compensation must be always adequate to the intensity of the, of the caused uh, harm. So now, I would like to make a conclusion why I did talk about all these three issues which at the first sight have nothing in, uh, in common and uh, maybe do not even relate to, to aviation law. Well, uh, I wanted to stress out on the basis of these three uh, examples, practical examples, that, uh, that negotiation and dialogue between the diverse uh, countries, in this case between the European Union and Russia, is still uh, very necessary. As regards the, the VAT issue, I believe that this is one of the practical issues which could or even should be handled in, uh, in uh, the air services agreements, maybe even in a, in a general uh, agreement on aviation between the European Union and, uh, and uh, Russia. Not, of course, this, uh, such an agreement should not deal only with VAT, but, uh, but there are a couple of other, other practical issues which could be, which could be solved. At the, uh, at the end, all these differences have uh, or might have 
a negative impact on the competition. That there are diverse criteria for Russian airlines, for example, or diverse criteria for European airlines uh, in either the European Union or Russia. It, it doesn't play a role, but there are still big differences which lead or could or can lead to a distortion of, uh, of competition. Um, as regards the civil law issues and the, the compensations, I, uh, also, I, I heard very, uh, very gladly the, the presentation of Professor Malayev because I, I fully agree with him. I am also a fan, let's say, of, uh, of a unified uh, air law or aviation uh, law convention, for example, which would also replace uh, the, or which could also replace the Montreal rules, because uh, the Montreal rules are uh, currently, let's say, the, the minimum standard of, uh, of liability of airlines uh, and uh, of compensation for, for passengers, but uh, in the biggest, uh, let's say, aviation centers of the world, like, like uh, the United States, uh, uh, Russia, the European Union, and Asia, you have completely uh, different rules, which are something sometimes more st uh, more strength or, and, uh, than the than the Montreal uh, than the Montreal rules. So. Uh, I believe that these uh, differences could be also partially solved, uh, at least by uh, some multilateral uh, agreements, and the national civil law should serve only uh, subsidiarily to, to the international convention in these, uh, in these issues. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm ready. Distinguished colleagues, I cannot but respond to the, to the previous speaker's presentation because serious issues have been touched upon. This system of exchanging information allows us to exchange experience. Uh, the colleague said that non-refundable tickets are not available in Russia. Let me disappoint you. The federal law on non-refundable tickets have been enacted and is in force as from July the 1st this year. Full stop. So yours truly at the State Duma did much to have this bill enacted. There's a very important global topic is the air service agreement topic. There are indeed two different approaches as, uh, to the so-called designated carriers, which is explicitly stated in the air service agreements. Right, there is a decision of the European Court so that all EU member states uh, were given the black mark that you need to go and revise your agreements with non-EU member states so as to eliminate from the AAS, ASA the notion of national carrier or the carrier registered in the respective state. Let me note here, I have m talked about that more than once, that the Russian Federation is not a U EU member country and is not going to abide to the decisions of the European Court or European standards or requirements unless they fit well with the Russian interests. What our partners and ourselves have done, no, n not about Finland, there has been no precedent. We have not changed our philosophy regarding the international air traffic. What we have done is uh, there are three countries, EU member countries, including Finland, with whom we have prepared drafted amendments to the air uh, service agreements whereby we cancel the phrase only uh, the, about the exception being given to nationally registered or designated carrier. But what we have left, we don't care who flies from Finland or Luxembourg or elsewhere or Austria, uh, because we have uh, an agreement with Austria not signed yet, uh, it doesn't matter, no matter who it is, the owner could be German, Italian, you name it. But 
that entity must be legally registered in the Russian Federation. And that state, in line with the international norms, will be responsible for that carrier. It's not that whoever wants to fly will fly. Uh, most all countries, except perhaps very, very large European countries, like Germany, most all of them, uh, of them uh, are begging Russia in the narrow so when we talk in the Euro narrow circle, begging Russia not to agree to the European carriers because the Czech Republic will have no national carriers because they will not be able to compete against Lufthansa or Air France. Everybody understands that. And they want Russia not to accept that. And the dialogue should be honest. So we're not talking on not only in the best interests of Russia, but also in the best interests of the EU member of the airlines from the EU member states. Let's be quite honest. As for the moral damage, well, among the lawyers are uh, reading the Roman law canon that the claimant must prove the moral damage. I wouldn't even elaborate on that. The Roman law here is present in mo most all European countries except the Anglo-Saxon law countries. Similarly, in the Russian court, there are quite a lot of such lawsuits, and the Russian legislation, federal one, federal legislation, and the secondary legislation provides for the right of every citizen to have the moral damage compensated in case of any infringement on the air service agreement. It is provided, so you are free to go to court whether or not you are a Russian citizen or a citizen of any other country who has used the service of the Russian carrier. It's another matter why you request one million rubles. I think any court in the world will base its decision on the specific evidence to be provided. That's a standard thing to be found in Russia and elsewhere. And to conclude, as the presentations began, uh, you, ga uh, you gave an advice that the budget found some money to pay some money to the airlines. First of all, it is provided already, and it's been in place for about four years now. So f if you want to fly from the Far East and belong to some vulnerable, vulnerable categories, you pay just 50% of the price. Uh, regional passengers also can enjoy the subsidy. The only thing I'd like to recall that the EU is smaller in size than the Republic of Yakutia Saha. So I think we'll handle this matter, how we fly best. Thank you, distinguished... Co Just uh, allow me to, to react very, very quickly. Uh, thank you uh, for, the, for the information about the... Uh, the non-refundable tickets, That's, that was new uh, for, for me. And uh, as regards your statement to the air services agreements, I cannot others than fully agree with you. Uh, we have to be very open on this, uh, on this topic and the Czech Republic would also never itself request an EU designation in its uh, air services agreement with Russia if it would not be forced by this open skies decision of the European Court of Justice and by the policy of the European Commission. Thank you very much. So, will you please clarify the situation, if you are in a position to clarify, between the ground handling services and satellite uh, service, service, services? Do you understand the question? Yeah? Ah, please. So, sorry, I did not understand the last part. <laughs> so, whether you are in a position to clarify the situation between the connection or dependence in error between the ground handling services and satellite service handling. Do you understand? Ground handling services and? Satellite. Satellite, satellite services. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I do not see too much uh, connection between them. Okay, thank you. Colleague, my limited. Colleagues, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, we have one more presentation to hear by, Yuri, by uh, Sergei Sergeyevich Yurev, who will speak on the International Convention on 
aviation law. Well, good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. Everybody has felt that uh, we do air aviation law. We have much more air in here than during the previous sessions, don't we? Well, I'm joking. Before starting, I ha I'm on a mission. I want to give you the uh, congratulation from the Mr. Neratikov, uh, head of the agency, Federal Aviation Agency. I'm advisor to him. He wishes us a successful conference and good luck in what we do. We uh, handed over the official text to the organizers. Now let me start my presentation, which uh, is going to be very brief, or rather shortened, because many things have already been considered. But this helps me identify some aspects not mentioned before in full depth. First, our ma master, Mr. Malev, has told us perfectly well about the need to revise the Chicago Convention, and I quite agree with him. But there are some aspects to pay attention to because of this revision. The right uh, of charter on regular flights. This uh, secures the right to uh, carry out flights without the permission of the government. And many countries uh, deny this right uh, with reference to the sovereignty clause. But there's an interesting case uh, that concluded in February 2014 in Moscow. Uh, a Russian entrepreneur used his private jet to fly from the Czech Republic through Kaliningrad to Latvia. The plane was reg registered in the US. The entrepreneur submitted the flight plan to the central dispatching office of the unified air traffic system of the Russian Federation, and the plan was never okayed. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the Following that, um, the, the entrepreneur um, went to court um, peti petitioning that uh, the Russian government's air traffic rules uh, must be um, repealed and all um, government officials as well as the provider company's officials um, should be punished because they all violate Article 5 of the Chicago Convention. There were lots of nuances, but the uh, lawyers uh, 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 who represented the government bodies uh, s declared that uh, According to um, custom, the uh, convention was not applied um, uh, in full, and uh, the um, uh, action was rejected, and the uh, court uh, wrote down that uh, in accordance with the existing international custom, uh, article, the article of the convention was um, uh, applied uh, with uh, adjustments um, uh, uh, taking into account uh, the national sovereignty uh, issue. And um, uh, I have cited this because uh, courts may uh, recognize uh, certain provider activities uh, as illegal. And this is one uh, thing. And talking of courts, I would uh, point out two more elements uh, of um, note. Uh, in the first place, the International Standard and Recommended Practices, an ICAO document, uh, our courts perceive them as uh, obliging documents, as mandatory documents. And I know that the Russian Federation's uh, policy uh, seeks to uh, use and uh, um, comply with those standards to the maximum. We have uh, uh, instances when courts uh, consider ICAO documents as mandatory for fulfillment. I didn't quite understand uh, the previous speaker when he mentioned issues with the VAT. Um, I don't think it's an institutional um, issue, but rather an issue of law enforcement uh, 
because even uh, uh, one letter may be sufficient to resolve it because the Ministry of Transport has uh, given a full list of all the fees and duties at the uh, airports and the VAT and um, airport and air traffic services uh, were um, exempted from uh, the VAT. And then the next argument is uh, the um, Air, navig air navigation service uh, fees. Uh, uh, according to our, uh, the rules, uh, the governments uh, are obliged to provide uh, information uh, to the users of uh, airspace. And uh, in case of failure to pay, uh, 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 complaints should be uh, filed uh, and um, not uh, not by governments, but as uh, individual uh, entities. And that's, I think, a gap in um, uh, judicial practice. And another issue has to do with uh, air accidents and their investigation. We know that the air uh, law um, under the Chicago Convention is based on the no, no one uh, guilty uh, principle. Uh, that is, when uh, uh, air accidents are investigated, uh, they seek uh, to prevent uh, such incidents in the future rather than to establish the um, guilty party. But there's another principle based on the uh, criminal uh, aspect of uh, social relations, uh, which is the principle of punishing those uh, guilty, the guilty party. And these two principles uh, collide with one, collide uh, with one another, and uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, statement of uh, um, statements uh, by um, inquiries, inquiry committees uh, are used uh, as uh, proof of uh, criminal liability, and ICAO should uh, pay attention to this situation uh, so that we could really combine these two principles, uh, the principle of uh, um, Inevitability of uh, punishment and this uh, principle of no guilty party um, uh, of um, uh, civil aviation inquiries and investigations. Uh, and I have, I think that the uh, Convention on the S Law of the Sea of 1998 is a good uh, precedent, and unlike the Chicago Convention, it is a lot. Um, has a, lo a lot more annexes. Uh, the Chicago Convention contains only 19 as compared to 98 uh, to the Convention of the Law of the Sea, and such a code is necessary. And also, all kinds of institutional changes um, entail the need uh, to establish the competence of uh, intergovernment organizations. And uh, based on uh, various uh, uh, statements about the global management and uh, uh, risk society, we need uh, to realize uh, what the limits are of uh, the competence uh, of such a global body or another body if it is to be set up, because we can see that in Europe um, as well, uh, the rules are not always uh, in compliance with national interests, so that some uh, reasonable balance of interest must be found um, in the convention and in the uh, managing body and or authority. Thank you, Sergei. I've tried not to lead you down. You have not led down anyone, but uh, you have... Um, made the final statement, I can say, uh, and although we are few uh, colleagues, we are not a few. In fact, uh, we are not numerous today, but uh, we are to, to be followed by others. And we organize uh, regular conferences on, the, uh, on air law in uh, St. Petersburg, and Sergei Aristov uh, attended the first conference. Some of the colleagues uh, attend it regularly, and we are going to hold the fourth one, uh, air 
lore.ru uh, is the website uh, of the conference. You can visit it uh, to know more. Of course, there are more questions uh, than answers today. There have been more questions than answers. We've tried to avoid acute political issues. Uh, at least uh, here it would uh, take up a lot of time. Uh, because uh, air traffic control over the Crimean Peninsula, the legal issue of uh, uh, flight and uh, air navigation services uh, uh, fees, uh, service fees uh, f uh, over Russian territory for uh, foreign carriers. There are some very pressing issues, but uh, today's uh, panel uh, can indeed uh, be considered as uh, having fulfilled its purpose. Uh, thank you all, and if you have questions, do ask them to the speakers in private. But may I just say a couple of words as usual? Are, are those going to be verses? Uh, well, I could do that, but later. Uh, as we assess the situation, one should also be aware of this historical fact. The Chicago Convention was uh, drawn up in 1944 when World War II was not over yet. And the United States uh, made the convention uh, fit for itself, uh, and the number of uh, nations was uh, extremely small, and the absolute majority of today's ICAO members were never members uh, uh, or parties to the Con Chicago Convention. So why do I think that it was um, indeed suited to uh, U.S. interests? For example, Article 5, uh, um, uh, notices of uh, flights without prior permission. Whose, uh, air, uh, whose planes were able to fly then? All Europe was in ruins, and only U.S. aircraft uh, were able to make such flights. Those were um, intelligence uh, and reconnaissance flights, uh, uh, even regular traffic uh, under Article 6. Well, it does require uh, uh, prior permission, but who uh, held, who held uh, um, this capacity? Uh, only uh, the United States. And finally, uh, coastal uh, uh, shipments, uh, shipments between two um, uh, uh, places in, within a country. And what is the point of those um, coastal uh, shipments if if you give uh, uh, the right to such um, uh, flights to one uh, company of one state, you must uh, give that permission to all other members of the or parties to the convention. Uh, well, at that time, the United States, maybe Canada, were the only ones. Uh, uh, it was uh, only nice in words, uh, but there was no real um, aviation, and uh, this article is never complied with. Um, and maybe the transport ministry representative uh, um, will correct me if I'm wrong. But a few years ago, we uh, gave uh, Lufthansa the right to um, uh, uh, fly between uh, certain cities uh, on the Volga River. We did not give that right to anyone other than uh, to any uh, anyone other than Lufthansa. It's strange that you don't know that. No, we have not given them that right. All right, colleagues, uh, that seems to be it. Thank you. See you again next time.